Hi YouTube, welcome to another video with the Aviation Enthusiast on Airway Sim. Today is going to be the fifth uh, video I make on the, the training for a speedy recovery game world. So without further ado, let's just go in, see where we're at. So the game world is now in March 2020 and today in real life is the 9th of April 2020, so we're close to the real date actually. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a, a big impact of COVID on here. As far as I can see, not yet. We are seeing a big profit numbers, which is good. Nearly a billion in cash, which has been growing. So generally my airline is in a healthy condition. Um, what I wanna show you is um, a few things in this video. So it's to give you an overview of what I've done since the last update, but also give you an introduction to how efficiently do tech stops and do those stopovers as best as you can. So first thing I wanna share is show you an overview on New York, where we're at with New York, my base. This will eventually load. As you can see, we're down to four airlines there. So one airline has uh, um, not survived. Uh, it got squeezed out, started losing money, and eventually declared bankruptcy. Um, I am the largest in terms of market share for passengers and cargo. I am only focusing my airline on New York, I have not expanded onto into any other bases. Um, so this, this guy is pretty focusing a lot on passengers, uh, also in New York, whereas this airline, which I thought was going to struggle, is doing very well with a lot of cargo. And it shows, if you're following my 50 tips videos, um, cargo is very lucrative, and he's really focused on flying cargo uh, from many bases. And uh, He's still flying four fleet types, but for some reason the commonality costs seem to be manageable in this game mode, at least for now, for the first five years. So we'll, he has to keep an eye on that to see if that's going to go up or not. But uh, yeah, he's making more profit than I am. Uh, but it doesn't result yet in market share in New York because he's focusing on other bases elsewhere. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight as well, which I'll come back to, is like the slot situation in New York. Um, Slots have started to run out, as you can see, um, and there's a direct impact of that. Well, before that, I am the leader in slots, very closely followed by the other guy. Um, we seem to be jumping positions day in, day out on terms of who's the leader in terms of slots. But the guy is flying more domestic flights than I am, so therefore he needs to have more slots. Um, the direct impact of that is my traffic level in New York is at level 10. This means that my slot costs are going to be very expensive. Uh, and also the infrastructure level, as you can see, has gone to level six. So there's an expansion in progress. And this will be uh, completed by the 16th of August. Now, when this clicks in, it means that my slots will move to 90 departures per hour because for every, there's, there's a correlation between that. So there's a multiplication factor. So we're now at level five, and we get 75 departures per hour. So that equivalents to 15 um, departures per hour per infrastructure level. So when level six becomes available, we will have 15 slots extra. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go wildly schedule on the 16th of August. There will likely be um, a block in place where you can only, you have a limitation in terms of the amount of slots that you can get. Uh, this tends to be for, you know, 24 to 48 hours in real life, where you will be limited to five uh, to 50 uh, slots um, per every five game days so you can't schedule a lot uh, you have to check back regularly to buy the slots then this is to make sure that nobody just hoovers up all the slots and some while somebody is offline um, so this is why that that's in place everybody has a chance to grab some slots now quickly overview in terms of my airline where we're at I'm making around 200 million profit per week and what I noticed from my competitor that I mentioned with the cargo, he started uh, making lots of money on on cargo and I looked at his fleet and he's flying a lot of 747-800. So I started looking into those as well and I quickly noticed that the 747-800 was not that much more expensive than the Airbus A330-200 freighter at the time and it c carried nearly double uh, the amount of cargo. So it made sense to start going after that, especially given in New York I have the demand for it to to fly this kind of aircraft for the freighters. Um, so as you can see, I've started ordering them. Um, they are making a lot of money. I'm still ordering my Airbus A330-200s, and I'm predominantly focusing on cargo growth now. Um, 
if we show you quickly where I am in terms of my profits with my aircraft you can see uh, generally the aircraft generate most profits are my 747-800 freighters now there's quite a big list of aircraft generating losses that's just because I just scheduled them in the last uh, few minutes before this video so next week this should start to disappear and uh, start to become um, profitable now those with an eagle eye you might have seen that I've got four fleet types on order and you might question why that is if I go back to show you what I've got on order um, my aircraft fleets So I've got the Airbus A320s which I fly. Uh, I've also started adding some cargo ones, so A320-200 freighters. Uh, I managed to buy some cheap um, 15 to 16 year old Airbus A320s, passenger ones, which I then converted uh, just before the D-check was due, and I'm making them into uh, cargo planes, and I'm flying them domestically, but also sometimes, um, you know, to Mexico where I have the mount, uh, or even to like Europe with a, with a stopover. So you can use those as well. Uh, or to large bases in um, Japan, so you have quite a lot of them mounted in Japan, uh, but some of the bases they have short runways or they are at infrastructure level 2, which means the very large aircraft like the Airbus A330 or the 747 can't land. So that's one it's good to op operate a large aircraft type like the Airbus A320 uh, for the cargo. Uh, so you can see here I also added the fourth fleet type. Now you can see I put them for sale, so these are clearly not for me. And for those who have been following my 50 tips, one of the points I mentioned there is that you can, aircraft sales can be very lucrative. So these are actually a request from my alliance a partner who wanted to fly this, this aircraft and he wants to get the aircraft deliveries faster than he can get from the, the production line. Uh, I had some excess cash, so I, I put a big order in for him, um, take advantage of the big discounts I can get and then sell them at a nice profit to him. So to give you an overview in terms of uh, how much I'm actually making per aircraft um, so the aircraft's on order I can just show you how much I paid for these so I just put a 20% deposit down and on delivery I paid the 80% rest so overall these come to about 39-40 million uh, per aircraft uh, costs to me uh, I'm selling them to my uh, alliance partner at 65 million so that's a 25 million profit on each aircraft which is you know a much bigger uh, return on investment than you can imagine from just flying the aircraft for a while uh, for the first few years so in terms of the you get a lot of money back quite quickly and it's a nice income stream if you can afford it um, and my alliance partner is happy because he gets the aircraft faster than he would have just been if he relied on him just by ordering him himself so it's a win-win uh, for both of us um, and it gives me the extra cash flow to keep uh, developing my own airline as well. Um, so yeah, this is really uh, an overview on what's been done with the fleet types. Um, so one thing I wanted to cover as well is to talk about uh, tech stops. So let me just show you an example of um, how to do an efficient tech stop. Let's just go, let's imagine we go to, to Asia. We, let's say we were going to fly cargo to uh, Japan. Um, you know, let's just go to Tokyo which is, we'll have tons of demand and will be a common route to. My cargo pa uh, planes, they typically have between 3,500 and 4,000 nautical mile range, so you need to do a stopover. And you know from cargo, it doesn't matter if you have one or two uh, stopovers, um, you clearly want to fly as efficient as possible. So this example will show you how to do it well and how you shouldn't do it. Um, so. So as you can see, there's already before the graph show, there's quite a lot of demand. So I'm already flying these with passenger planes. Um, and you see there's, there's tons of cargo demand. So, you know, potential demand of 600,000 kilograms, uh, actual of nearly 200,000. There's already, you know, quite a lot flown by my competitors. And if we were to look, my competitor is flying via Honolulu, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, does not make any sense. Um, so if we just do sh the way to really do an efficient um, tech stop is use a website called uh, Great Circle Mapper. So it's uh, the website is gcmap.com and it looks like this. And in the way to, I'll give you an introduction how to to use this and how to help you with uh, finding the ideal uh, stopover. So first thing you do is you put in your four letter code for your airport 
and then where are you going to fly to so in this case it's Tokyo Narita and we can just do show you what it looks like it'll give you a, a straight line map in terms of that's the most efficient flyover now um, what you can then do is now I personally know what's going to be an optimal already from experience but I'll show you some of the settings that I tend to change I tend to change this to nautical miles to make it uh, fall in line with the measurements on airway sim and then you can have here this uh, area here called ranges so let's say my 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 planes they typically have 4,000 nautical mile range so I'm going to put in 3,500 because with the wind sometimes there's a penalty so 3,500 nautical miles at New York and 3,500 nautical miles at Japan Tokyo Narita and I press draw map now see what this does it basically this is uh, a range that can be flown from um, Tokyo above this graph here and this is above this line here is what can be flown from New York so this area here in between is the overlap so ideally you're looking for an airport in this overlapping area here which I'm just going around circle around so basically you're looking for Alaska somewhere which will limit your options now depending on where you are in the world you might not know what airports are nearby there so you might say hey um, how do I find out what's the best uh, optimal airport there from looking at Airway Sim? Now, a way of doing that is go to your um, airport information place, and I'm going to select uh, the region that in, is in. So we're in North America, which is that where that area is in. That's still North America, and I'm going to go on View Airport Map. Now, what this gives you is gives you an overview of all the airports available for North America on a map. And you can already start to focus on the area where you need to go. Um, so it will come eventually. So we're, we're focusing on this area here, Alaska, in terms of the optimal uh, airport. So one of the things we were looking at is you also want to try and find airports that are open 24 hours. Because with tech stops, you don't get to see initially when they land or when they not land. But you'll find out when you schedule them. Or oh, the airport is not available at this time. So you, you ideally want to try and find airports that are 24 hours. So this one looks okay but after further inspection see this is 24 hours problems you have here is infrastructure level so you could not fly a 747 here and also the runway is quite uh, short um, although I've noticed that sometimes the infrastructure level does not matter for tech stops but the, the runway in any case here is a bit of an issue so I would not focus on that airport uh, going back to the map um, you would Thinking about geography, you would know that Anchorage is in um, in Alaska, so that was definitely one that you would want to check. Uh, but another one you can check here is Dead Horse. This is not going to be a 24-hour airport. Um, the one I've got in mind here is um, Fairbanks. So Fairbanks, let's double check. What we can do is like, look, it's got 24 hours infrastructure level or, and better long runway as well so you're not going to get penalized from a cargo perspective that um, a short runway where you'd not be able to f take off with full takeoff weight you so you want the runway to to be long enough as well so we now go back to great circle mapper and let's actually compare a few options here so we're going to compare uh, anchorage which i had in mind we're going to compare fly via fairbanks which I just identified and we're also going to fly via Honolulu which my competitor is flying just to can see the difference in impact in terms of distance that's actually being flown so uh, put a, a comma again New York let's start with uh, oh, not equals but Fairbanks and then it's also at Anchorage you get to know these after a while as you can see the convention way of doing it so and Honolulu oh, wrong one. and then we draw map now it'll give me I'll give you all the different options on a map in terms of how it's being flown so we now scroll down and we look at it so which is the most optimal route so it clearly shows that via Fairbanks it only adds point so this is your benchmark 5861 nautical miles if you were to fly di direct 
um, if we were to fly by um, Fairbanks, it only adds you know 21 nautical miles, so 0.4 percent. Anchorage is still not bad, but it's, it's not as good as Fairbanks. So you ideally you want to go via Fairbanks. Uh, it adds 0.7 of a percent extra on it. But when you look at it, Honolulu is just way out. Uh, as you can see, it's also out of the the area. Um, you know, so you would have a, a range penalty in all likelihood. Uh, so you you'd have restricted payload. But also, you know, in terms of fuel burn, you're flying 30% more than what you really need to. So, you know, not only paying more in, in fuel, you're also reducing your payload. So um, I'm not sure why my competitors flying via Honolulu, um, but it clearly shows you that this is not the most efficient way of doing it. So for this example, you would uh, do a tech stop via uh, Fairbanks. And that's typically how you uh, find out how to do the most efficient tech stop. So. Anchorage would be acceptable. My my view is usually when you need to schedule the tech stop, aim for below plus two percent. Uh, if you get within two percent, that's uh, good enough, I would say. Anything above two percent, uh, you should look for uh, a better option, unless there's obviously no alternative airport in the area that overlaps between the two airports. Then you would have to consider it differently. Um, but yeah, this is the approach to make sure that you do a really efficient tech stop. Um, just you will have the you know reduced uh, fuel burn so it saves you in cost and uh, in time as well so you get to squeeze in more routes uh, potentially so it, it, it is an important factor to make sure that you take this in mind so throughout the game it's important for cargo when you look at the jet age area even for passengers you will need to take this into consideration so this is a great website a great tool that you can use uh, to do efficient uh, tech stop scheduling so if you've got any questions on this or any other topic for Airway Sim, just leave a comment below. Um, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I hope you found this uh, a useful um, a session in terms of uh, training on Airway Sim. Um, thanks again for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll put on some more videos in the coming weeks to give you an overview on how this game is developing. And uh, keep safe, everyone, and keep in touch. Thanks. Bye.